Welcome to the Gospel Hour with David. I'm so happy you guys made it today. Today we got a great Bible study. We're going to go over Romans chapters 8 and 9 a little bit. And a little bit from the book of James, or the letter of James. And we're going to talk about chapters 1 and 2. And you know, let's think, is Paul... Or is James arguing with Paul about works versus faith? Because Paul says we are saved by faith in grace alone. Right? And yet James says, you know, faith without works is dead. So are they arguing with each other? Makes you kind of wonder, does the Bible or do these people, are they contradicting each other? But I say no. Both Paul and James agree that faith without works is dead. You know, Abraham didn't just have faith. He believed. Believe is an action. Faith is an action. Faith produces good works. That, that's evidence of faith alive in our lives. The production or producing of good works. So, like James, what he's saying in the letters of James, how, what good is faith, right? What good is faith if we ignore justice? What, what good does it do us? Well, what good is faith if we ignore righteousness? Doing right. Paul says the same thing. It says here in, uh, Chapters 8 of the book of Romans, verse 31. Let's start right here. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies? Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who? shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written? For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love God, for the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? Right? So, Paul asks a question, right? And he's saying, Are we, do we, have free will? Do we, the people of this earth, we, we believe we have a choice, we, we believe in free will, but in that we kind of take away God's free will or God's ability to choose, right? And, and that's the thing that I want to make it clear that it is God who calls us in, into his existence, into his presence. And how does faith come? By hearing the word of God. And that's God being in our presence. Maybe, maybe God, and God doesn't need anything from us. God doesn't need any worshipers. God seeks a son. God is a friend who seeks a friendship. 
He doesn't seek worshipers and religious people. He seeks to be a part of our existence and for us to be a part of his existence. I suppose for God, and I don't know, I don't know. I suppose for God, being in existence or existing has no value if nobody knows who you are. And maybe the silence made God feel lonely. And he wanted to be known. A lot of people still believe God desires a sacrifice or, or desires us to do good, do good deeds in order to please him. Yet God was very pleased in, in making us just the way we were. He made human beings. And, and human beings came out to be violent. And, and abusive, very slanderous. And in their own ignorance, they, they, they didn't even know who God was, but wisdom told them that there must be something higher than them, a higher power, a greater being, a greater force than, than the people of the earth. And yet the people of the earth transformed the goodness and the holiness of God into like idols or corruptible images of men. Yet ignoring the fact that God is spirit. And although nobody knows where the Holy Spirit came from and nobody knows where the Holy Spirit is going. But when the Holy Spirit passes our way like the wind. We know it's, it's in our presence. It's all a, a great mystery. Godliness is a mystery. Ungodliness is a great mystery. Why would, why would a holy God create ungodly people? And, and that's the thing of God is he's showing his mercy unto us, right? Whether we're Gentiles, Jews, males, females, whoever we are on this earth, we, we, we have been created by God through the will of God. And, and here's what Paul says about that in Romans chapter 9. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unseeking, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption. The adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promise. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So, Paul agrees that Jesus not only is the Son of God, but is the very likeness of God to the point that the Christ, the Messiah, is God himself. Blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. Right? And that's why Jesus come, right, to uh, abolish, many people believe, the Old Testament, or the Law, or the Torah, but Jesus did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, to fulfill all these things. Now, the Law did not fail. The Law and the Torah produces sin, 
It produces it. It manufactures sin. If I had never read the law, if I never read the words adulterers are unholy and cursed, right? I, I would have never known what sin was. Liar. Thou shalt not lie or bear false witness. If, if I had never saw that law, if I had never read that law, I would have, sin would have never existed. So the law produces sin, but did the law fail? The law did not fail. And the law is perfect. Even though the law was not delivered by God himself to Moses, but it was delivered through angels. And the angels placed Moses as a mediator, the law, in between men and God. And yet Jesus comes to take away the mediator. That thing that, that puts a wedge in between us and God. Takes it away. Did the law fail? The law is holy and righteous. The people failed. God found fault with the people who could not live up to the accordances of the law. For not all who were descended from Israel belonged to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year. I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only a son, but also when Rebekah had conceived children, by one man, our father Isaac, through were, though they were yet not born, and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's promise of the elect might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. If we go back to Genesis chapters 33 verse 3, and start reading there. We see Jacob and Esau as they reunite. In that, we, we, we see these promises in a fleshly form so that we could understand the mystery behind God's holiness. Jacob takes and he lines up all of his children from the least to the greatest. Holding back Joseph and Benjamin in the back because they came from Rebecca, or his wife Rachel, who was in her elder age, right? And she died in, in the birth of, of Benjamin. Yet he, he puts all of his children and all of his slaves and, and all of his concubines and whatever, the, all the least are in the front. And he sends them ahead and he and the greatest or, or those who are most dear to him in the back, and there they're heading back to uh, the land of Canaan, they're heading back to where Jacob was born, and there's Esau, and, and they see Esau's coming with, with hundreds of men, and they're all dressed as though they were ready for war. Yet when the two men came together, Jacob bows himself to the ground, bows himself to Esau saying, forgive me, I have done you wrong. And Jacob says, here, all these children and my wife and all my flocks and my herds are a gift to you. 
Take them. And he saw stents. They stand up. And they hug. And they weep. And, and love. And, and mercy. Triumphs. Over judgment. Over condemnation. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exhortation, but on God, who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that you, that I, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. Or do we have free will? Do you believe you have free will? Or, or could God have taken away your free will when Christ came? Did Christ, Jesus Christ, have free will? For one of his last prayers, he says, Father, if there is any other way that this can be done, let it be done that way. But not my will, but your will. But your will. God wills men. He wills you. Through, through an unseen force. And that unseen force is, I matter. I matter to God. I matter to Jesus Christ. I matter to myself. I matter to my surroundings. I matter to my countrymen. And as Paul says, and I cry out day and night with deep sorrow and anguish for, for my heart and my soul. Many people in America say they hate Socialism. But I say, without universal health care for all peoples, there's no way into heaven. Right? What stops us from wanting and desiring universal equal health care from the greatest to the poorest. What stops us from getting it? The United States government? We the people? You, me, God? Our unfaithfulness? Our unwillingness to, to love our neighbors? There's many times in my life I have felt as though surely I have been born in a state of Gomorrah and my neighbors are those of Sodom capitalizing on the weaknesses of their neighbors yet rejecting love rejecting justice rejecting righteousness I mean God forbid we gave health care to, to, to homosexuals. God forbid we gave health care to drug addicts. God forbid we gave health care to the mentally disturbed or ill. God forbid. God forbid. Or is it God who forbids? Do we have free will? Do we have a choice in this matter. And maybe we don't. And maybe that's what frustrates us. And maybe that's what makes us angry. It's because we think we have free will, but we don't.
You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what the molder say to the will the okay <clears throat> excuse me will what is molded say to its molder why have you made me like this has the potter no right over the clay to make out the same lump one vessel for honor honorable uses and another for dishonorable use what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called. Not from the Jews, but not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed says in, he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not my beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very same place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. Right? And we see like in, in the book of Revelation, 